What's up guys, it's Dollmatter here, and today we're going to be reacting to another Drakini Fell video. So this one we've got the HMS Courageous, guide number 64, part one of two. So, uh, it's, these are only five and a half minute videos, but he put it into two parts. I'm guessing this is something he did back in the day. Uh, but regardless, link to the original video down below. Let's jump into it. Five minute guide to the Courageous class battle cruisers of the Royal Navy. Okay, so it's a class. I thought okay, it was a specific so these ship. Aren't the strangest ships to ever be built. The French won that award even before the Dreadnought hit the water. But they're surely up there in the top ten. In Pretty an quiet. era where everyone, including the rest of the British fleet, was thinking of battle cruisers as ships armed with eight or nine 15 inch guns or above. Battleship grade armor, etc., etc. Along comes something half the displacement, half the armament, and a quarter of the armor. Oh, and it's officially a large light cruiser, which is about as honest as this through deck cruiser or <laughs> this destroyer. Perhaps it would be a good idea to reflect on why these things were built in the first place. You see, the first Sea Lord at the time was Admiral Fisher, the man who had introduced both the Dreadnought battleship and the battle cruiser to the world. And he had a plan the so-called Baltic Project, to try and shorten the First World War. You see, in the east of the German Empire was Pomerania. It was less than 100 miles from Berlin and had nice flat beaches and no defences. Why no defences? Well, the Russian Baltic fleet wasn't a threat to the larger high seas fleet in offensive actions, and anyone else would have to come through the narrow and shallow waters between Denmark and Sweden which meant larger, slower, and more heavily armoured ships would have problems, whilst Germany's Kiel Canal allowed them to move full-size capital ships back and forth easily. So Fischer's idea was to send a seaborne army through the Narrows, land on the beaches, and capture Berlin to end the war. To repel surprised German cruisers and provide fire support, a fast ship with a shallow draft was needed. An improved version of the renowned class battle cruisers was suggested, but there was a restriction on building anything larger than a light cruiser in 1915. So instead, the ships were given the armor and speed of a light cruiser, the armament of half a battle. So, did they ever actually build any of these things? Because it, it seems like that they're using all pictures of non-existent boats. The ship. Like draft and pictures. the size and displacement of a battle cruiser, and labeled large light cruisers. Someone somehow bought this cover story. The ships would be capable of thirty-two knots with oh, they three did build them. inches of armor. Count them and a main battery of two twin 15-inch guns, one at each end, six triple 4-inch guns, and a pair of anti-aircraft guns, and two single torpedo tubes, because when you're charging around in an oversized tin can, getting in close enough to torpedo an enemy is clearly high on the list of priorities. <laughs> and to cap it all off, this bizarre armament clearly wasn't enough, so whilst the first two ships, the Courageous and Glorious, were built to this specification, the last ship, Furious, was designed with a new main armament two single 18-inch guns replacing the twin 15-inch turrets, although in the event only the rear gun was ever fitted. All three ships were laid down in 1916 and launched the next year. Their utterly nonsensical nature continued in service, being so <laughs> lightly built the Courageous sustained significant structural damage in a storm and needed oh. repairs and stiffening. She was then fitted... Jesus Christ, the fact that a storm is messing them up. Imagine... I I'm guessing these things did not fare well in combat. It is a mine layer, of all things, only to never be given any actual mines. And then in 1917, both Courageous and Glorious were given a half dozen twin torpedo launchers, for a total of 14 torpedo tubes scattered around this gigantic ship. Why? What exactly were they planning? Furious got even weirder, if you can believe that. Halfway through building, once the rear gun was installed, someone decided to put a 10 aircraft hangar and a flight deck on the front. Now, look at the picture. Can you spot the slight issue you might have landing on this thing? Apparently, you were supposed to go around the superstructure and slip sideways for your final approach. After testing showed that this was shockingly not the most ideal way of landing an <laughs> aircraft, the rear gun was removed, incidentally ending her career as the most heavily armed aircraft carrier in existence, and a second flight deck was built at the back, with the funnel and superstructure poking out of the middle. So they just converted this thing into an aircraft carrier, essentially? Like a really bad one? This was, phenomenally, even less successful, thanks to all the turbulence and the hot burning gases uh, exiting out the back of the funnel, and after three attempts, the use of the rear flight deck as anything other than a tennis court and giant sunbathing strip were forbidden, except for the odd airship. 
the two slightly less insane ships did actually get to fight in the second battle of Heligoland Bight. Here, a force of German cruisers, destroyers, and other small ships found themselves being run down by British cruisers, the battle cruiser Repulse, and the Courageous and Glorious. The two large light cruisers opened an intense barrage and mainly managed to hurt themselves. The left hand gun in Glorious's forward turret had a shell go off inside it, and repairs were needed to fix the damage to both ships from their own muzzle blast. <laughs> they managed a single 15 inch shell hit on a German cruiser in exchange. Furious actually got to use its aircraft to attack a Zeppelin base with moderate success, and then all three ships turned up for the German surrender, no doubt to the great confusion of everybody else. <laughs> with the war over, the ships went into reserve pretty quickly, but with the Washington Naval Treaty curtailing the number of ships with battleship-sized guns, much like the Americans with the Lexingtons and the Japanese with the Akagi, the British found they had some large, fast, lightly armoured ships they really didn't need anymore, and the first flash of useful inspiration in these ships' careers showed when all three were slated for immediate conversion into proper aircraft carriers. That's it for this video. Thanks for what- What a weird shit. Like, everything about that is just so weird. I can't believe they, they got, like, past in development. There had to have been some, th like, he had to be in pulling, like, some political strings or something, because, like, that just seems, like, so obviously disastrous. You know, maybe it's just hindsight is twenty twenty, but it just seems like such o an obvious bad idea that it's like, how did this happen? But anyway, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.